Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original. Moo Performing Arts honors the Asian American community with taiko drumming and other cultural productions. A penciler for DC Comics, Doug Mankey draws some of the most recognized comic book characters. The philosophical chamber rock band, Cloud Cult, led by Craig Minowa, releases their 10th album, Love. Breeze. These artists and more, now on Minnesota Original. Once upon a time. I wish in a far off kingdom, more than anything, lived a young maiden, more than life, a sad more young than lad. Jewels. I wish. Moo Performing Arts is an Asian American performing arts company. Uh, our primary activities are theater and taiko, and taiko is the Japanese style drumming. We are a bit of a unique company in North America because we do both on such a main stage professional level. The mission of Moo is to create um, great performances based upon arts equality and justice from the heart of the Asian American experience. The key phrase, of course, is from the heart of the Asian American experience. That's what identifies us as a particular company uh, with a particular racial ethnic identity. But the focus on arts equality and justice really means that the work we do, we want it to be not just art for art's sake. We want it to have some kind of social commentary. We want it to have some kind of impact on the awareness of our audiences. We do a, a wide range of work. Um, we do new plays, so we, have, we develop new Asian American playwrights, um, both locally and nationally. We've done new musicals, like The Walleye Kid, the musical, which was a creation of our own company. But also we've done standard Western musicals, like Little Shop of Horrors, and now we're doing uh, Into the Woods. Into the woods, the path is straight. I know it well, but who can tell? Into the woods to lift the spell. The story of Into the Woods is based on characters that go through the woods that are all characters that we've learned and grown up with. Cinderella, Little Red Riding Hood, and all these stories from our childhood and how all these people interact in the woods. When we first talked about doing the show, I wanted to do something different about it. So I began to think the stories here can really be as set in Asia as well as Europe. I mean, a lot of those folk tales have similar stories in Asian cultures. If you look at the set, of course, you see all this bamboo, and bamboo is so classically Asian. And once I did that, then I started bringing in certain cultural styles into the play. We're picking an Asian theme for all of the characters. The spell is on my house. Only I can lift the spell. The no, spell no, the spell is on our house. We the baker and his wife are going to be representing Korea. We've got the Hmong influence with Jack and the Beanstalk. Cinderella is representing the Philippines. The narrator and the witch are mixed Asian influence. In the standard production form, the witch has the stick and it's a magical stick and the witch has magic and powers and things like that. I decided to give the witch certain powers through long sleeves called hansan, which are part of the mass dance form in Korean traditional culture. It creates a whole different quality to the character, even though all the lines are the same and the character is essentially the same. So it's interesting that we start doing a, a different kind of twist on something so standard as Into the Woods. I love working on Into the Woods because it's a reinvention of, you know, a kind of a classic. And I have never heard of anybody having this interpretation or doing it in this direction. I personally feel that Moo has played a huge role in the theater community. We have been able to create a, a new kind of understanding and experience and respect for Asian American culture and performance uh, for Asian American artists in the theater uh, community. 
In 2011, we published a, a new play anthology, Asian American Plays for a New Generation. Of the seven plays in the book, six of them are plays that, that were developed by our company and were produced, uh, given their world premiere by our company. Asian American theater, in the form that we understand it now, is probably since the mid-1960s. So that's only 50 years of, of history, in a sense. So, so the idea of churning out and creating new and exploring new plays is really, I think, an important aspect of Asian American theater itself. So for us, we really wanted to, to do that as part of our mission, as part of, of what we think is important, giving voice to the Asian American writers, in a sense. For us, there's always an Asian American perspective uh, whenever we approach work. That may be as simple as saying, we have Asian American performers that we want to be in this and, and showcase their talent. The next level is we do that, plus we're gonna show this in, within an Asian American cultural context. Or we might create new work that reflects the issues that we want to deal with. But there's always this Asian American perspective or lens that is the way we look at material, whatever it is. Never say goodbye unless you're losing If you're all I need to get by, then get a hold of me It's the same old song unless we're on You're my honey pie So come over here and be all I need to get by Give you a little time You don't know what life is Until you've lost What kind of hesitant To give up on What with all the stories Of how people try to try to get by Stay a little longer for a while All I want is you and all your love It's making me helpless but you're never careless Keeping me going Let's be relentless and be all I need to get by stick to one everything to one everything and more I can bet no other has found what I see what made me write this song so please come on over whenever you want stay
My very first experience with a comic book would be when I was five years old. We rented out a room, my family did, to a, a man named Mike, who was a comic book collector. And he brought comics home, read them, and gave them to me. And the first thing I thought of after reading my first comic book was, this is what I want to do for a living. Age five. My name is Doug Mankey. I'm a penciler for DC Comics. What would my five-year-old self think? Yeah, he would say, yeah, you, you did it, buddy. I, I knew you would. I've worked for 17 years on nearly every major title at DC. I worked on the Superman, Batman, and The Flash, and Wonder Woman. And I've been working, by the summer, it'll have been four years on Green Lantern. The Green Lantern has been around for probably as long as I've been around. It's based around the idea that these characters called the Owens had forged rings that they would give to, to people worthy of the ring. They have to be fearless, they have to be brave. You wear the ring and then your mind is able to conjure anything that you, that you can think of. So you're limited by your imagination. These big pages, single heroes on them, or large shots of heroes, we tend to call them splash pages. And even though they're the fun ones to draw, and the ones that just about every comic book wannabe uh, artist would prefer to draw. They're, they're not really what comic book storytelling is about. I mean, I enjoy it when I get to break out in a big fight scene and raw and, you know, show two characters with cosmic powers destroying planets. But at the same time, if I'm on street level and I get to draw an old man and he's taking his grandkid for a walk, I like to do stuff like that because it has personality, it has humanity to it. My job is really, to me, defined by trying to see the script come to life. When I finally get into my hands, it's broken down into pages, panels, and all the words are there. You know, and then I sit down and I, I, I pour over the script and I, I methodically go through and I make notes and I try to compile a list of the things that I'll need image-wise. And then I just sit down and I start laying out pages. I'm not always thinking about a finished figure, but I'm thinking about how a, how a page is weighed. I try not to be redundant. So for example, if, if something is in the foreground and pushed to the edges, unless there's a specific reason to repeat that, I'll, I'll often like slightly tilt something, take a different perspective on it, move it over so it's not perfectly down the middle. Working through and creating a good composition on a page, in other words, one that is visually fun to look at, easy and it flows, not distracting, but the eye naturally follows a, a frame of motion through from the first panel down to the last one, is, is really important to me in trying to, uh, to get that down right as soon as possible before I start truly fleshing in characters. So at first they really just look like you know amorphous shapes as I, I put weight on the page. After that, I start in on details. From my hands then, they're sent directly to an inker, and the colorist sits and does whatever magic that they do uh, using Photoshop. And then it goes to the printer and shipped all over the world from there. We're just busy trying to trick people. You know, we're trying to, we're trying to pull emotion out by the stagnant image that you see in front of you. And make people feel like they're seeing something moving. Here we have Sinestro and Hal Jordan, both guns blazing as the villain has destroyed their construct. And then the eerie, creepy panel as he's overpowered and, and leering and, and frightful. And then when we have Hal with grim determination, we pull the, the shot in nice and tight. So we get a, a, a shot of his ring coming forward, looking over his knuckles, you know, giving this illusion or this feeling of something coming right at you hard and fast. There are all kinds of little tricks that I use personally. I, you know, if I have a large menacing character, it's not bad enough looking up, but if you turn the angle just right, then it's intimidating. You'll find me grabbing my mirror a lot as I draw, looking for uh, errors in symmetry and, and uh, composition. I see something here I'd like to change. 
So I sit here and I nip and I tuck and I trim a little off of his head on one side, add a little bit to the other, like a sculptor, you know. When I look at my responsibility in my job, and that is to tell a good story, the people I'm really thinking about most are the fans. Comic book fans are a very dedicated bunch, and they take their collecting, they take their interest in the, the medium very seriously. I want to give them something worthwhile, so at the very least I know that I've given it my best. It's fun business. It's comics. I get up in the morning and I wear the same slippers comfortably down to my studio and sit down and draw for a living. I'm always really excited that time of the month when I go, oh, and the, you know, the truck should be pulling up and they should be dropping off the latest comic. I can't wait to see it in print. You know, that's exciting. Do I consider myself lucky? Yeah, I'm absolutely lucky. It's amazing to me to think that I'm actually doing what I, at five years old, wanted to do. The Buddhist concept of uh, reaching enlightenment involves completely losing the ego and the self. I feel that the best performances are where you lose yourself. This is system, a mystic sight. There's no such thing as time. If God is now and everywhere, why is it so hard to find? Wanna be the guy who lives in the moment? Not so lost in my mind So I guess my show starts now My show starts now My name is Craig Minowa and I am singer-songwriter of Cloud Cult. Everybody here is a cloud And everybody here will I feel like the Cloud Cult journey this whole time has been a spiritual exploration, a search for the higher power, longing to find the meaning and truth in life, and uh, also to find our son, in a way, who passed away when he was two. You were born into a strange world, like a candle you were meant to share the fire. I don't know where we come from, I don't know where we go. After our son passed away and just really struggling to try and find answers and, and meaning and direction um, and finding a lot in that journey, now having the opportunity to be a father again, I've got two kids now and reminds me of the importance of right now. Connie uh, Minowa, who is my wife and also one of the live painters on stage. We've been together for 20 years. Uh, we were living up in Duluth at that time and created uh, Who Killed Puck? Who Killed Puck was the first CD under the Cloud Cult name and I started working on that in 1996 and came up with the name Cloud Cult not necessarily with any intention of having a band, uh, going out and playing live or anything like that. I had played in bands prior to that and I really just wasn't comfortable with it. What I feel about music, and I feel it's a very sacred kind of uh, expression. The concentration then starts to get a little bit more into trying to peel back layers of the self because there's a lot of layers between the outside world and the inner self that get in the way. If we're not conscious about them and really deal with the fact that we've got to look at ourselves in the mirror and face the ugly things over and over and get them out, we're never going to get to that true power that I think that we're born to be here to put out. I heard Grandpa on my transistor radio 
Turning his bones 20 years ago And he said, kid, there's something that I'd like to show you Get your things, it's time for us to go So I grabbed my backpack and my flashlight And a bag of caramel corn I got my bicycle and the radio And I headed on the road I said, I'm ready for what I'm about to Yep. The creation process is different from most bands because I have a studio at home. I like to just record things when I, when I need to and I really like to sit and digest every moment of the song to make sure that I'm feeling right about it. It's not something of where we get together and just jam and, and figure out um, what it's going to be. It's usually orchestrated. Since I do scoring work, everything is orchestrated already and recorded like that. And then they'll come in and record individual parts and then that gives it sort of a human, uh, you know, gives it the human feel to it. Performing on stage needs to be a spiritual experience for me, and it's our responsibility as musicians in the band to be completely present and completely devoted to putting all of ourselves into it. With the last couple of albums, there's been more fans that have come to us with personal life crises that they've gone through. And, you know, you get a lot of these personal stories and it's hard to not be really, you know, emotional about it. And what's beautiful about this group of people is that we hear these stories, we experience them together, and you can tell before we go on stage that everybody in the band is grounding themselves and realizing that I, I, have, I have a mission here, I have a calling. And, and they all go out there and do it, and I look at them on stage and they're having that same kind of just empowering experience, and it's, it's, uh, it's quite elevating. The chemistry and collection of people that we have now after all these years is, is really profound and they're all very deep and uh, connected to the messaging behind it. The new album is called Love and it's the 10th Cloud Cult album and in reaching the 10th album, I looked back on the, the albums and felt like the recurring answer was really simple in a way, which is love. And it's interesting because it's become such a cliched kind of thing, but it really is a pretty powerful, pretty powerful thing. Drive, baby, drive until your troubles come. Run, baby, run Until it all goes numb You are the wind, the flood and the flame Nothing here can get in your way You've gone too far to care what they say Now you're the only thing in your way Having the opportunity to be a father again reminds me of the importance of being present and embracing 
the beautiful moments that we have with each other, with our family, with our friends, and with this very short life. Who knows how much time I have left? <laughs> Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.